She's one of the most powerful women in the world. The leader of 160 million people and one of the world's most impoverished countries. In interviews, she's strong-willed and feisty. That's true. Mm -hmm. But today, we'll see a different side to her. A daughter still mourning her beloved father. I have to fulfill my father's unfinished job. My guest today is Sheikh Hazina, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Cheers. Thank you. about to embark on a trip with Sheikh Hazina to find out more about her life and the history of her country. The two stories are intertwined. Bangladesh, a troubled nation, and a nation that's had a bumpy ride since independence, 41 years ago. Poverty and corruption, assassinations and military coups. Each decade brings cyclones, leaving more than half the country underwater. How on earth do you govern a country like this? The Bengalis' troubles started 66 years ago with the British partition of India. On the frontiers of a vast territory, two dominions take shape and begin their separate lives on this memorable day. Under partition, Pakistan was established as a Muslim homeland. On paper, a brilliant idea. In reply, Mr. Jinnah said, we are parting friends, and I sincerely hope we shall remain friends. In reality, 1,600 kilometers of northern India separated East and West Pakistan. The two lands were also divided by cultural differences. It could never work. Into all this, Sheikh Hazina was born. The daughter of the man who would lead the Bengali fight for liberation. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the central political figure in the struggle for independence. Was he, was he a, a strict father, in fact? Um, he was a strict, no doubt about it, but he was the most lovable person. He was very caring father, very lovable father, and he tried to give us more and more time. He used to take us to the park in the early morning, in the morning work. So we have so many memories. But it wasn't all a walk in the park. West Pakistan built up wealth and power at the expense of the East. Pakistan depends for its economic life on foreign aid, which is granted on the basis of population and in theory should favor the East. In practice, East Bengal has only been getting 20%. The Bengalis claim they've subsidized West Pakistan to the tune of 3,000 million pounds since independence. To counter the growing influence of the West, Sheikh Mujib started a language movement to prevent West Pakistan's outlawing of the native Bangla language. The Pakistani people, they don't speak Bangla, so they tried to prevent it. They wanted to impose Urdu as a state language. So my father started this movement, the language movement, in 1948. His decision to fight came at a price. I can remember one occasion in 1954, Early in the morning, when I come to my mother's room, I was very young. Then I saw my mother, she was very upset. Then she told me that your father was arrested. He was taken into custody. But when my father released from the custody, that was a really very joyful time for us. During our childhood, mostly we stayed in the village with my grandparents. That day, we couldn't understand anything. We're heading to Sheikh Hazina's grandparents' house. Getting to and from the village is easy for a prime minister, but for a young girl with a protective grandmother, 
It was very different. I was not allowed to go to the school. Why not? Because he, she was afraid. Oh, I see. Because, because I have to cross the, you know, canal by a wooden bridge. She was very much afraid that if I go, if I just cross this wooden bridge, I may fall in the river. My father was in jail, so if anything happened to us, so he, he, she was very protective. What are your memories particularly of your mother? Well, my mother was a wonderful lady, you know. He, she sacrificed a lot. My mother never complained anything. She used to look after the whole entire family affairs. Yeah. Our education, household, even my grandparents, they are very old. So she and she used to support him. In absence of my father, she used to look after the party and how the movement is launched, everything she used to take care. Oh, really? But I learned from my father as well as my mother how to organize political party, how to organize a movement, how to support the movement. The, politically, she was very, you know, mature and she worked very hard. But Sheikh Mujib's crucial role against the West made him a marked man. He realized he might be sacrificing his life. I, I, he, he, what he was doing was dangerous, yes. He never thought about himself, only for people, how he can ensure or free people from this exploitation, oppression, that's why, for the sake of the people, he always take, you know, any kind of steps which is really, which was dangerous for him, but he never bothered for that. He was always ready to sacrifice his life for the sake of people. I can tell you one thing. Nobody should play with the fire. In the 60s, tension increased further between the haves of West Pakistan and the have-nots of East Pakistan. Sheikh Mujib dreamt of independence, and he carried his people with him. Rebellion was bubbling. At that time, we were so excited about what was going to happen. There was hope in the air, we were jubilant. Uh, we were going to get independence. Huge rallies in Dhaka's Ramna Park attracted hundreds of thousands of supporters. Everyone was in the streets, so you, you were there right in the middle. And that was the time when, unquestioningly, we, we all rooted for Majid. This was the man who was going to give us liberation. Bengalis demonstrated in no uncertain manner that their allegiance now belonged to Mujib. He became the symbolic inspiration of the spirit of independence from 69 to 71. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman is the man at the center of the crisis now threatening to split Pakistan apart. In West Pakistan, he is disliked, mistrusted, even hated. But here among the Bengalis of East Pakistan, he is idolized. I remember walking back from there feeling so elated we were going to have this land of our own. An extraordinary result in the 1970 Pakistan general election meant events were soon to come to a head. In the general elections last December, the Sheikh's Awami League swept the board, capturing all but two of East Pakistan's seats in the Constituent Assembly and thus gaining an overall national majority. Suddenly the East could rule the West. But Pakistan's President Yahya Khan would have none of it and refused to accept the result. When Pakistani people didn't, you know, hand over power, actually that was the clarion call to the people of Bangladesh to free the country. Sheikh Mujib took up the call. And then he, he made historic broadcast. If we take our machines, in Dhaka yesterday, Rahman, who has long fought for self-government for East Pakistan, addressed a rally of his followers. Western radio station calling itself the voice of independent Bengal, broadcast that Rahman has declared East Pakistan an independent nation. 
You remember those days? Yes, of course I remember. Yes. On 25th March in 1971, it was spread out all over the country. He was arrested, but the message got through. On behalf of our great national leader, the Supreme Commander of Bangladesh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, do hereby proclaim the independence of Bangladesh. The key sentences in that wireless message was like this, from today Bangladesh is independent. But the euphoria didn't last long. West Pakistan stamped down on the east. The war started immediately after, after the declaration. The war was to be one of the most brutal of recent times. We were attacked. The Pakistani occupation forces started up the worst ever genocide in the history of the world. 90,000 Pakistan troops poured in. Attacking people unprepared for war. There was a newspaper which was pro Army League, and there were flamethrowers. This place had been set alight, people were running out, we could hear the screams, they were running into a wall of machine gun fire. They went on killing spree of innocent unarmed Bengalis. And when they retreated, they burnt all the houses of the innocent people, innocent Bengali people, and killed brutally. They killed people. They burned their houses. They looted it. Miles and miles after miles of human habitation were burned down, and women were raped, children were killed. Everywhere there was dead body. I have seen in my own eyes. People have spoken of the fact that there was the genocide of three, three million people and so on. Other people, and Pakistanis among them, obviously have said it was fewer, it was 200,000 or 300,000. Each and every family, they suffered. Someone from their family, nearest and dearest one, been killed. And not only that, they killed our teachers, doctors, engineers, all type of people, so that we cannot run country in future. All the intellectuals, they killed. So I don't understand how people want to reduce the number. It's absolutely correct, the number declared, it is absolutely correct. This was Dhaka, the capital of East Pakistan, a few days after the army had moved in to crush the Bangladesh secession. Eyewitnesses said 24 entire blocks of the city had been flattened and as many as 6,000 inhabitants killed. Here in the courtyard of one villa, an old man and his family, three women and their babies, were bayoneted to death. It's a horrible picture. You cannot, you know, now you can see how genocide took place, mm. how people been killed, entire family was assassinated. On December the 3rd, 1971, India intervened on the side of the beleaguered Bengalis. Their forces routed those of West Pakistan, and just 13 days later... Watch it, this one's going, going, going! West Pakistan surrendered. After two weeks bitter fighting and bloodshed, what was East Pakistan could now become the new nation of Bangladesh. Weeks later, Sheikh Mujib was freed to lead his country. And of course it was to talk to Sheikh Mujib that I came here. His first interview after he'd been released from uh, West Pakistan um, and spoke to him, one of the most memorable interviews I can recall. It is so good to see you. I, just now, I, I'm so happy that now I am holding a press conference. I know, so that you can't do our interview now, but I should, we shall listen. Are you going to go tomorrow? Tomorrow would be lovely. Just near my sail, they have digged a grave. I've, I, I'm seeing that. 
You knew they were doing that? Yes, I've seen that in my own eyes. And I say, oh, I know, this is my grip, perhaps. All right, I'm ready. Do you think first of your country or, for instance, of your wife and children? No, I feel for my country and my people. And then your wife and children? And then my family. I, I love my people more. My father loved his people more than his family. He, uh, yes. yes. And we are proud of that. And you're proud of that? I'm proud of that, yes. Yeah, yes. Because my father used to say, unless you love your family, children, how can you love your people? Yeah. A person, if he can love more his fam people, yeah. he can sacrifice his life for the people. That's something wonderful. But Sheikh Mujib struggled as leader. Bangladesh was in ruins, unable to recover from the effects of the war. As we watched the refugees, suddenly we noticed a curious movement. We moved nearer, and she turned out to be an old woman aged anything between 80 and 100. She appeared to understand my questions, but would only reply, all gone, nothing left, none left. Million and billion people, you know, they flee from this country, their house has been burned, there was no food, no currency, Nothing. It was just the ravaged, war ravaged country. Economic collapse, food shortages, and terrible poverty. People turned against Muji. Revolutionaries are not necessarily good statespeople. And I didn't think he had, uh, he was sufficiently aware of that difference. He tried to run it badly. Uh, but the things that went wrong started with the one-party system. In a desperate bid to save the country, Mujib cast democracy aside. Your father had surprisingly uh, announced he was going to have a one-party state. Was that, was that a good idea? Well, you see, as because my father loved his people and he wanted to ensure people a better life. That time, um, he thought that he should take some steps so that he can rec recover the economic situation very quickly and rebuild this country. It is not exactly one party. He wanted everybody to be united for development of the country. I asked this question to my father. He told me that at least for three, four years, we have to continue that. So he was, he, he, he was suspending democracy, but going to bring back democracy. Yes. In another no, few, few no, years. Democracy you're was yeah. there. Democracy was there. He wanted to bring back parliamentary system of democracy after three years. In the early hours of August the 15th, 1975, Sheikh Hazina's life was to change forever. You were in Germany at that time, weren't you? That's with, true. With, with your sister. Yes. How, how did you get the news? In the early morning, a phone call ran. I don't know that day that phone Still, I feel the, the horrible sound I heard. We were staying with our ambassador, the ambassador's house. So ambassador himself, you know, pick up the phone. Then he didn't say anything. He said that you call your husband. Then I said, oh, why, you can tell me. Then he said, no, please wake him up. Then I wake him up. He went there. And then he told him that there was a coup in Bangladesh. A group of rebel army officers had taken matters into their own hands. Still, we didn't know what really happened. Because the television, it was in German language, so we couldn't understand much. The officers burst into Sheikh Mujib's house in the middle of the night. They went from room to room, 
on a killing spree. My feeling was that then nobody is there. Perhaps we lost everybody. The same day, our ambassador, he took me to his room, he has his wife. Then he told me that what happened, everybody was assassinated. They slaughtered everybody in the house. 17 members of the family, including Sheikh Azina's father, her mother, and her three brothers. The intention was to kill off the bloodline. Sheikh Azina had to explain that to her younger sister, Rahana. I couldn't tell her what really happened. She was so young, you know, she is 10 years younger than me. Then I thought that she should know gradually. I was only four years old when um, our family was murdered and my grandfather was killed and my sister was even younger. And my mother didn't want to tell us what happened. It was too uh, tragic, uh, you know, for, uh, it would have been too traumatic for a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. But what she would do instead is she would cry all day. When you lost so many of your family, but at the same time, you were not permitted to attend their funeral. No, actually they didn't allow us to come back to our country. We tried to come back. We reached Delhi. But after coming there, you know, I met Indira Gandhi. She offered us that you can stay here because we are not allowed to come back to Bangladesh. Sheikh Mujib is buried in the family village of Tungipara. These Bengali people, my father loved them so much. How could they kill him? How could they assassinate them? It was a big shock for us. A big shock. It was very difficult to believe. Orphaned, exiled and devastated. One thing kept Sheikh Hazina going. She was determined to complete her father's mission. She was very close to my grandfather. She was the eldest and uh, he would tell her about his dreams, about his vision for Bangladesh. And uh, she, knew, she knows what he intended to accomplish, and he wasn't able to do that. So she has completely taken it upon herself to finish his vision of what we call Shonar Bangla, Golden Bengal. We'll find out how she went about it in part two. I've come to Bangladesh to meet the Prime Minister, Sheikh Hazina. And so this is the centre of the community here in a way. We've seen her devastation following the assassination of her family. How could they kill him? How could they assassinate him? She would go on to become a powerful but controversial leader. This is not a nation that takes care of its own people. And now she's fighting to win a third election. If they vote for me, I'm here. If they don't, I'm not here. Thank you so much. I've returned to Bangladesh for the first time in 41 years. I'm traveling around the country with the Prime Minister, Sheikh Hazina. She's showing me some of the places that mean most to her. Bangladesh is the eighth most populous nation in the world. Two-thirds of the population, more than a hundred million people, live in the countryside. A thousand years ago, when it was part of northern India, Islam swept across the region. And today, 90% of Bangladeshis are Muslim. But there are Hindu temples alongside mosques in most villages. And everywhere there are rivers. 
They are the lifeblood of the country. Villagers whose lives and traditions have changed little over hundreds of years depend on them. Sheikh Hazina has a vision for the country, a golden Bangladesh, she calls it, following on from her father's vision. It's her life's mission. A Bangladesh where every man, woman, and child has the basic necessities of life, uh, enough food, shelter, clothing, education, uh, medical care, uh, a Bangladesh where everyone is at peace. Uh, they don't have to be wealthy, but there is no poverty, there is no uh, shortage. That's, that's really the dream of a Golden Bengal. Today, dignitaries line up to meet her. But she wasn't always welcome. Hello, we welcome much. you on the soil of Tungipara. Thank you very the much. Land of Father of the Nation. Well, that is a great honor to be here. In 1975, her father dead, her family murdered, and Bangladesh in meltdown. Sheikh Hazina was exiled in India. And so begins a tumultuous era of coups, counter coups, and assassinations. After 75, about uh, 18 coup that, that took place in our country. So there was no democracy at all. Sheikh Hazina was ready to fight for democracy in Bangladesh. And in 1981, she brought her family home. They thought that nobody from this blood will come back and take, you know, the initiative. But I came back here, took the challenge. My children were very young. It was very difficult to come back and the, the then government tried to prevent me so that I shouldn't come back. But I decided to return, come back and to work for democracy. When she first moved back to Bangladesh, it's, it, was a, it was a very scary place to be. Uh, I was a teenager and we had no freedom. There was no democracy and she fought. But her fight for democracy was all too reminiscent of her father's. During that time, she was arrested repeatedly. She was targeted for assassinations. She was shot at. There had been 19 attempts on your life through all these years. I mean, how did you come to terms with that? Well, you see, in 75, I lost my nearest, dearest one. Yeah. And so I don't ha have any fear about my life. On the 21st of August, 2004, a grenade attack. They thought that if they can assassinate me, then perhaps they can stop this. They can stop my voice. They almost succeeded. 22 of her supporters died and 500 were injured. It was carnage. She herself was badly hurt. I know my father sacrificed his life and I am ready to sacrifice because I have to fulfill my father's unfinished job. My grandfather gave this country independence. He fought the military dictatorships and gave this country independence. I believe my mother gave this country democracy back. That fight for democracy dominated the 1980s. Sheikh Hazina worked with her sworn enemy, Khalid Azia, the leader of the Bangladesh National Party. The hatred between them went right back to 1975. Zia's husband had founded the BNP and had taken over power after Mujib's assassination. It had started what was in effect a blood feud. So this type of Deep hatred, mistrust dominates the Bangladesh politics. It's not the like traditional political rivalry. It's deep mistrust, deep hatred. The collaboration between the two women bore fruit. In 1991, democracy prevailed. But it was Khalid Azia who became Prime Minister, leaving Sheikh Hazina furious. Election was manipulated many times. The result was you no know, change and so many anomalies I found 
in the election process. The feud between the two women reignited and it has dominated Bangladeshi politics ever since. These personal issues, family issues, those issues have generated so much hatred between these two ladies, between these two leaders, and they always want to equate these issues with idealistic issues. Could you ever work with her seriously again, or is the, the rift just too, too wide? We have ideological difference. Yeah. Because our party was established to ensure people's right. Every election, each and every election was free and fair. That way we conducted it, because we believe in democracy. But on the other hand, if you go through the history of BNP, during their time, local election or any by-election, every time there was killing, conspiracy, manipulation, so many incidents took place. So there is a basic difference. This was the first meeting between the two ladies in 15 years, an indication, say optimists, that it may be the start of a new era in Bangladesh politics, though not everyone agrees. I think the biggest difference between the two parties is the difference between the two ladies who head the two different parties. We've always had a dysfunctional parliament in Bangladesh since 71. We've ended up having one single party sitting in the parliament, the opposition never going to the parliament, and two leaders at the top who don't communicate with each other. If the two of you run into each other, uh, say, in the room down the corridor or somewhere, you would speak to each other of course, normally? Of but. course we do. Yeah. Of course we do. Mm. You know, when my father was president, Jawa Rahman was an army officer. Mm. He used to visit our house very often with his wife. Mm. So yeah. In many occasions, social occasions, right. we met, we exchanged pleasantry. Right. So that is not the point. Right. It is absolutely ideological. Mm. Is how you run Ideological, yes. Of course it is ideological. They may have ideological differences, but perhaps there's one thing both women would agree on. I think men are very jealous. Men because, are. Yes, men are very jealous. They're jealous, of, jealousy, of, of, jealous, je of, women. jealous of women getting, getting into power. And that's true. Hmm? <laughs> that's true, because they cannot come to power, that's why they are jealous. What I think, uh, this is my feeling. In 1996, 21 years after her father's assassination, Sheikh Hazina's dream came true. Well, after 21 years, we formed government. জনগণে ভোটের অধিকার প্রতিষ্ঠিত হয়েছে সেজন্যই আমি আনন্দিত সেই সঙ্গে সঙ্গে আমার মনে পড়ছে এই ভোটের অধিকার আদায়ের জন্য যারা আত্মাহুতি দিয়েছে সেই সব শহীদদের কথা But as in her father's time the real challenges would still lie ahead Corruption was rife then, and today Bangladesh is still among the most corrupt nations on earth. How is the battle against corruption going? One always reads about corruption in Bangladesh and so on. Is there more or less today than there was 10 years ago? Of course it is less. You know, if you see that wherever military dictator ruled the country, they patronize corruption. I feel that if there is corruption, you cannot develop a country. The people who make Bangladesh are the farmers in the field, the garment workers, the migrant workers, people like us, middle class people, live off them. Yet we do very little for them. This is not a nation that takes care of its own people. It's a question of who can utilize that term to get benefits for himself or herself. What does a leader have to do to stop corruption? Well, you have to send a message to the nation, to the people and those, in, those who are involved mm -hmm. in activities. They, if they can sense, if they can feel that, yes, from head of the government, we are not getting any indulgence or any facilities, then automatically it reduced.
Today, uh, we have essentially major right-wing political parties taking turns between themselves to run, or not run, to loot a country one after another. Sheikh Hazina is also accused by some of political manipulation. Three years ago, she instigated trials against alleged Bangladeshi collaborators in the 1971 War of Independence. Trials which have divided the country. What was your motivation in terms of the, the war crimes trials? In 1971, as you know, that there was a genocide committed by this the then occupied army, Pakistani army. And some of our people here, they collaborated them. They themselves killed many of our people. For Sheikh Hazina, it's very personal. Her grandparents' house in Tungipara was attacked in 1971 by Pakistani soldiers assisted by local collaborators. They attacked this house and they burned it. My grandparents were alive. They just uh, took them outside the house. They were sitting in front of them. They burned the house. With the passage of time, have you forgiven them? They killed our people. They raped our women. They tortured. And especially those who were Bengali. They are war criminals. So they should get punished. But opponents claim these are flawed political show trials. You cannot disassociate war crime trial issue from politics. It's not possible. But the question is how fair the trial process is. That is much more important. And you would find people in Bangladesh who would raise many questions about the degree of fairness at the trial process. I don't understand why these people are opposing it. A number of death sentences have been handed out by the court. All are senior politicians from parties opposed to Sheikh Hazim. There are 10 opposition figures on trial, including the entire leadership of Jamaati Islami and two from the opposition Bangladesh Nationalist Party. Jamaati Islami has enforced a nationwide strike in protest at the verdicts. The opposition claim this latest sentencing shows again how the Prime Minister is clearing away those who threaten to unseat her in the election scheduled for later this year. Sometimes you can hear the hue and cry from many quarter that you are taking revenge against opposition and this and that. It is not true. Law will take its own course. Those who lost their family members, it is their demand that these criminals should be punished. So it was our commitment to the people. If you don't try these criminals, then you cannot move forward because it is just like a curse to the nation. And what of the climate? Is that a curse? The country is a vast delta, a floodplain, fed by huge rivers from the Himalayas. Rivers are essential to the rural economy, and flooding is the norm. But cyclones bring devastation, and global warming threatens millions. This was 1998. A series of cyclones left more than three quarters of Bangladesh underwater. That was the worst flood ever, we ever faced in this country. The whole country, about 70% area, was underwater for almost 68 days. There was a prediction that 20 million people may die, but we took all the steps to save our people. We prepare food, we send them food, we send them water. We have you know, worked very hard. But because of the geographical situation of Bangladesh, we always face this natural calamity. What can you do as a human being well, with Mother Nature? 
the climate change actually Bangladesh is not responsible for. As the rest of the world dithers and argues about climate change, Bangladesh is on the receiving end. This is a country where 80% of the land is less than 10 meters above sea level. So rising sea levels are a real threat. Many developed countries, they are causing this problem and we are suffering. So they have also their responsibility how to mitigate this emission, how to, you know, save people. From Bangladesh side, already we have taken some steps. We started, uh, you know, a plantation, the tree, the green belt in the coastal area and also other area. But I think international community, they have their responsibility they should come forward with more assistance so that we can implement all our you know adapted plans program to save our people from these natural calamities that is very very important very important in spite of these calamities some predict a prosperous future for bangladesh it has a huge and very cheap workforce its garment industry is now worth $30 billion a year. But many of the factories are dangerous sweatshops and the consequences can be fatal. This is all that's left of an eight-story building in the outskirts of Dhaka. Authorities say the building did not meet safety standards, yet inside were factories making clothes for global retail brands. My son's name is Mehdi. Please, I beg of you, bring him back to me. If they can't find him, I'll die. Bangladesh is the world's second largest garment producer. The owner of the building forced all the workers to go to work. This is how he killed all the workers. I want him hanged. I want him hanged. Very sad story. What happened yes. is not, you know. You know, we cannot accept it because previous day it was identified that there are some crack in the building and our uh, law enforcement agencies and the local administration they asked all the workers to come out from the building and they stopped that you shouldn't uh, you know go mm -hmm. there so next day uh, they engaged that some uh, one from our engineering university, they will go, they will see the condition of the building and then they will decide. Unfortunate thing happened that some of the owners and their representatives, administrative officers, they force these garments workers to enter the building and then it was collapsed. These poor people they, they have come from relays to make their fortune. Unfortunately, they lost their life. There's a stench of dead bodies here, and rescuers have called off their search for survivors. Many of Bangladesh's garment factories are owned by the country's MPs and wealthy supporters of Sheikh Hazina. Could she or others have done more? Who do you blame for this? The, the people who run the factories? Or perhaps the, the customers in Britain or America? Should they have insisted on better conditions for the workers Look, here? I feel that the responsibility, the responsibility lies with everybody. Everybody? Everybody. Because the buyer, if they can increase the price of the government, then they can establish proper building. I feel it is a wake-up call for everybody. Now the owner of the factory or the buyer or other, everybody, now they will be cautious in the future. The immediate future for Bangladesh is a general election. In the volatile politics here, only one thing is certain. Tempers will fray, Protesters will take to the streets, and quite possibly worse. This was eight years ago, in the lead-up to the election. 
a black day. Can you imagine that one day, it was 2005, 17th August, one day within half an hour, all over Bangladesh, our 63 districts, 500 bomb blasted. In Dhaka city, about 35 places bomb blasted. Yes, that was our situation. An extremist group demanding an Islamic government use the tactics of terror. In the past 10 years or so, we've seen a lot of violence committed, especially by the uh, fundamentalists. That is the one thing that probably worries her the most. The loss of life, this violence. But after more than two decades of the same two parties and the same two leaders, even moderate voices are now calling for political change. There is definite demand for new political leadership or third political forces. But the supply line is weak. The problem lies there. But demand is definitely there in the society. Prime Minister, there's a general election coming at the end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, I'm assuming that, uh, of course, you will run again in that election and expect to win again. It totally depends on people. I am serving them. They elected me. So I am here as a Prime Minister. Next election will be absolutely free fair. If people are satisfied, if they voted for me, I will come. If they vote for me, I am here. If they don't, I am not here. But I want to establish that their voting right, their constitutional right must be established and they get all chance to vote freely and fairly and choose their own government. I've really enjoyed this second visit to uh to Bangladesh and I think I better not wait 41 years for my next one I might not be at my best then perhaps but uh, thank you so much it's been a joy and a delight to be here I'm really happy that after 42 years you are again in Bangladesh and again in the same house yes we look look forward to the next installment thank you very much indeed thank you